So I'm left with a pretty good, pretty substantial clump of hair like that. Now I like to pull out some of these extra long pieces just so they're kind of all about the same length. So I've got a pretty good clump of hair. Now we're not ready to tie it in yet. Well, you know what? We actually need to start our thread, didn't we? Thank you, John. John, you should have pointed that out to me. I'm here talking away and didn't start my thread. But we'll go ahead and get this prepped and lay it down on the table. And I also want to grab the tail in my left hand and pick out all of this under fur because it's really thick. And so I'm left with a slightly thinner piece. And I'm going to grab some of those wild hairs. And since I didn't have a start our thread first, just go ahead and take that and lay it where you, on your table where you can pick it back up again. Now this won't be a bead head. I'm this sure. is not a bead head, nope. So we want, to, we want to start our thread about a hook eye length behind the hook eye. So I want to, I want to leave, because I like to mark the forward part of my body here with my thread. That way I don't go too far forward with my dubbing and stuff. So I'm going to start that thread about a full eye length behind the eye. Wrap back to about the barb. So wrap back to about the barb and then take the thread almost back to the front but not quite back to the front. So I wrap all the way back to the barb and then go back forward to just behind the tie-in point, my initial tie-in point. Okay. Now let's try to pick up that, sorry about that, pick up that tail, that clump of hair we just, just had. And hare's ears traditionally have a fairly short tail. You know, many times we tie a full hook, hook length tail, but hare's ears have a tail that's about actually the width of a hook gap. So whatever the gap of that hook is, that's about how far to the rear we want that tail to extend. So I'm gonna hold it in that position. What, what's that, Peter? I didn't say anything. Oh, I'm sorry. So I have it about a hook gap, extended about a hook gap behind my hook. And then I'm going to secure it with my left hand. And then take a couple of loose thread wraps and tie it down at that tying point. And I'm going to stop right there for just a second and let you catch up. So I'm holding the clump in my left hand and I have it tied down near the front, near that tying point. Did you measure the length behind the... I did before I... Yes. So what was that length supposed to be? About a hook gap. Okay. About a hook gap. And it's not critical. Just It's just a fairly... It's a fairly short tail. Yeah. Hare's ears have a fairly short tail on them. So now I transferred that to my left hand. Now, to help keep that clump on top of the hook, I like to, to hold that clump. And I'm going to rotate my vise where you can see it a little bit better. I like, to rot I like to pull that clump back towards me, up and up. So as I wrap, it wraps back, or it wraps down on top of the hook shank. So I'm holding that clump up and towards me. And you can, now this is looking down on top, so you can see, see what that looks like. So I've got a fairly bushy little tail here. And that one's actually a little bit long still, but it's, it's fine. And take your thread back up to your tying point, about where you tied that in, and leave your thread there. And cut off your excess. fly only has four materials we're putting on. This tail is one the we're going to put the wire on next and then some dubbing and then finally a hackle feather and that's that's pretty much it. So ideally your your fur is on top of your 
of your hook. Because if you wrap too far back down this bend, the, the hair has a tendency to roll around the hook and it, it doesn't lay out right. So you wanna stop it before you get down into the bend area here. All right, now let's tie our wire. Oh, everybody caught up to this point? Yep, okay, let's tie our wire in. And the way I like to tie wire in is I lay an extra long piece here. I won't try to hold it exactly where I want it to be. I'll lay an extra long piece against the side of the hook and take a couple of loose wraps like that. And then I pull it back to about where I want it. And then just like I did the, um, the hair, I'm holding it up and toward myself. And I wrap back all the way to the rear. And you want to make sure you wrap to the exact same spot you stopped before. And maybe even one wrap farther. Then bring your thread back to about the hook point and let it hang. I just find it a lot easier to, to put a long piece of wire in there and pull it back than it is to try to, to measure it and tie it in directly in that spot. Okay. Then you just pull it back? Pull it back to where, yep, where the tip is about even with the front of your thread tip of the wire and then just wrap all the way back to the rear of your thread. And again, I like to hold that wire as I'm wrapping it, hold it up and toward myself. That's a trick Carlton showed me because that with thread and wire that helps. Notice how all the thread wraps are pretty much touching there. That helps that thread as it slides down the wire when you're holding it at that angle to yourself like this. It helps that thread slide down the wire and stack right on top of each other. So you don't really have to worry about gaps in your thread or anything else. All right, we're good. All right, dubbing time. If, if I, I heard the exclamation of excitement coming from somewhere back there. I think it was Rich Hudson. I think it was the half hitch man back there. Okay. I like to use dubbing wax, but since I didn't specify, this is um, Wonder Wax, which is really, really good dubbing wax, sticky, sticky stuff. I'm not going to use dubbing wax, but when I'm tying, I like, I like to use dubbing wax. So if you have it, I would apply a little bit of dubbing wax to about two inches of the thread there. Chapstick? I don't have any chapstick, so. I guess if my lips got dry, I could put dubbing wax on my lips, but. I don't know how that would work, but <laughs> spit works real good. So what we want to do, though, is the, the key to applying dubbing is not apply very much at one time. You want to really generally put just a smidgen, if that's an actual amount, a smidgen on the, I'm going to use a little spit like Carlson said. Yeah, just a smidgen, yes. Peter, do you say smidgen in New York, or is that something down? Yeah, I think that's kind of a universal word, yeah, I, smidgen. I, I thought it was, yeah. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> so I have about a, about a two-inch dubbing noodle here, and you see it's fairly thin. I can actually see my, my uh, thread through it. And if you can still see your thread after you wrap this on your hook, that's not a bad thing because that gives it a little bit of color in the water, so that's okay. So I have about a two inch dubbing noodle here. And notice I don't have, or I have very little dubbing, just some loose dubbing up here because that little piece of non-dubbed thread is what I'm going to use to wrap back to the rear of my thread. So my dubbing then will actually start so I'm wrapping that bare thread back. So my dubbing actually starts right at, and I just hung my hook, which is something you don't want to do. So my dubbing actually starts right at the rear of the hook, or rear of my thread. And then we just wrap forward. Don't worry if it's not really even, if it looks kind of clumpy. And I don't have quite enough dubbing, so I'm going to, um, Add a little more. 
I want to dub all the way up to the front of my, the thread base that I have here. Do you want it or not? No, you don't have to. No, because we're going to wrap it with wire. It's not going. You could taper it, Jeff, but it's not enough. Um, there's really not enough taper to it to. Um, it's just yeah, short, so it's. And it's such a rough, buggy body anyway. The taper's not going to show up that much. As you can see, this is like really buggy. And we're going to trim some of that off. You could leave it, but I like. I don't like quite that amount of bugginess. So once you get your dubbing all the way up to the front of your thread base. Let's go ahead and wrap your wire and four or five wrap. I don't fool with counter wrapping. Uh, you can if you like, but um, um, there's two, three, four. It's a pretty big hook. Five, six times gets me to the front. Now what I like to do, and this is something a little bit different in the front with, with wire, I like to actually wrap the wire once around my thread. So my, see here's my wire, I'm going to actually wrap my wire around my thread once and then pull straight up on it and then tie it in. That way your wire, it will never come out that way. So when, once my wire got to the front, I actually took a wrap around my thread with it and then brought it up for that final tie-in. And then, then you can helicopter it off, just grab it fairly close and spin it, and it'll break. How many wraps did you make with the thread there? A couple? Yeah, I did three or four probably. Now that's really buggy, so I'm gonna I'm gonna trim some of that. I'm gonna trim without trying not to cut my thread. I'm gonna trim some of those extra long pieces because you can see some of them even out in front of the eye, but that's just what hairs here does. We'll hold up just a second so folks can finish some dubbing here. All right, everybody dubbed up to the front? Okay. All right, you have, you have two colors of what? Okay, just a second. Okay, get, get your wire wound, okay. Yeah, you could weight it with, with lead if you wanted to 
want it to sink a little bit. This will run, unweighted like this, will run inside of a foot, probably shallower than a foot. So it's really good for shallow water. Uh, would work any any like on the little mo fishing it you could fish it like an emerger like an a and w just stripping it under the water if you see a few rises out there that aren't where they're taking emergers instead of dries just strip it under the water and it probably run four five six inches depending on how how fast you strip it so we put a feed below and then a uh, one like this above one two uh you could yeah yeah, or, yeah, you could actually do that. Um, soft tackles are often run in three or four, four of them at a time. But I would probably run two, you know, maybe, maybe a slightly weighted. I'm not sure I'd do a bead in the back because the bead's going to have a jigging action, which is going to affect your action on this fly. It's not going to pull straight through the water. But uh, hey, you could certainly put two of them in there. All right, I've got a little bit of extra hair there all right let's you have two colors of hackle uh they may be hard to tell apart but you have a dark hackle and then you have one that's kind of uh just a pure brown kind of a, like a almost a little reddish brown we want to use the one that's reddish brown not the one that is really dark so you see you have a dark one and then a lighter color one let's use the lighter color one and this is from the, the soft tackle saddle. Now, what I want to do on this feather, I want to get rid of all of this fuzzy stuff. Now, this feather, this feather shaft, this quill will break really easily. So don't pull real, real hard on it, but just strip all that fuzzy stuff off. And I've given you extra feathers in case you, uh, in case you do break one. Now, so I have most of the fuzzies off, but that's still not far enough. What I want is I want to get rid of any of these that have fuzz at the base of them as well. So. I want to, want to be left with something that's about like that. And... The general guideline for the length, the size of feather that you use, is that you want your feather to be, the, the, the feathers, uh, barbules, to be about as long as the shaft of the hook. And you can see that this one is, is almost exactly that. Doesn't really matter. It's, um, but now there's a number of ways to tie this in. I'm gonna show you one way that, that works, works well that for me anyway, that doesn't break as many feathers. I'm gonna hold the very tip of the feather and I'm going to then stroke back the barbules behind that tip. Now it doesn't have to be exactly even on each side, it doesn't matter. Oh, actually let me zoom out some, there we go. Let me zoom out a little bit. Okay. So holding the feather, strip back. Now we have before, we have cut this, and we're not going to do that tonight. We have cut this and left a small triangle here and used that triangle as the tying point. What happens there, and I discovered this on some random YouTube a few months ago and just saw it again on another one, is that when you wrap that thread straight on that quill, it's like the wire we, we spun a while ago. So as you move that, that feather around, it, that thread kind of cuts into that quill and it's already very fragile. So what we're going to do is we're going to tie it in in the middle there, in that middle spot, but we're going to use a couple of loose wraps and then we're going to pull that feather back just a little bit to where my thread is actually about here. And then that thread will be wrapped around a few of those barbules and the shaft. Now that doesn't guarantee you're not still going to break it, but it reduces the chance of breakage quite a bit. So, and you'll notice the feathers curved. So as we wrap it, we want those, those uh, fibers to sweep to the back. So we want to tie it down 
with the concave part toward the hook. So I'm going to just lay the feather on the hook like that. I'm just holding it with my thumb. And I am, it's jumping forward. So if your thread wants to jump forward on you, just give it a counterclockwise twist. I'm going to take a couple of loose wraps right in that middle part. Well, actually, I've got three there. And then I'm going to pull that feather back, not far, but just, just a little bit, and then take some tighter wraps. Pull it back toward the rear of the hook. So what I've done is I've pulled some of these, this part of the feather under the thread. And it gives me a little bit stronger tying point. And then I'm just going to slip my scissors in here and snip off any of that front feather. Take yeah, take a couple more tight wraps once you snip it off. Yeah, like I say, it's you still may break the feather, but you have a lot a lot better chance of not breaking it. And you can't pull very hard on these feathers because they're really, really, really fragile. So I have a pair of hackle pliers here. Carlton, you got you some of these, huh? These spring ones, yeah. These are stone faux hackle pliers. They have this spring in the middle of them. And I love them. I don't break near as many, because I shake a little bit, and I don't break near as many feathers uh, shafts as I did before. So I'm going to pull the feather, pull it straight up, and attach my hackle pliers to it. And then while very gently holding it up, I'm not going to pull back on the feathers. I'm just going to kind of pinch them to the back. I'm just mash. I'm not pulling back at all. I'm just mashing my fingers together where now you can see those feathers are kind of swept to the back. And that way, as I make wraps, I'll do it again. I'll pull those feathers to the rear. And don't worry if you have some in the front. We'll clean that up in a second. And I'll make a second wrap. And this is a fairly big feather, so I'm going to get one more wrap out of it. And now I'm back to bare stem. And I'll hold that bare stem up at an angle like this. Hold it up at an angle and run a couple of loose thread wraps over the top of it. And then snug them down a bit. I'm going to take my hackle pliers off. I'm not ready to cut it yet. I'm going to show you one more thing before we cut it. Man, that looks rough from here. I don't know how it looks on the screen. And then I want to take a couple of wraps in front of that as well, in front of that stem and then reach in and cut the stem off. So I took a couple of wraps behind and a couple of wraps in front. And then once you have those, just sweep the feathers back, any, any wayward front-facing feathers, and then create a nice little thread head in the front by wrapping back over your feathers. And then whip finish or half hitch. Thank you. My pleasure. And cut out the tag in, and of course you will. You, I'm, I'm not going to put head cement on this one, but you would want to use head cement. And that's it.
good trout fly, but it is also a bluegill getter. And that is a basic hare's ear soft tackle. About the only way you could make it more basic is you could skip the, uh, skip the wire if you wanted to. But this fly is kind of like, um, it's kind of like gumbo. You know, everybody likes to make their own gum gumbo. is kind of a platform, you know, it's not one dish. So this fly is, is a platform. As, as Jim mentioned earlier, you can weight it with lead. You could put a bead head on this. Uh, you could use different. You could use feathers for the tail if you like, instead of um, instead of hair. Uh, but this is the basic hair's ear soft tackle. Now, if I were to critique this fly, the tail's a little bit too long for my taste and a little bushy. Probably a little bit too much hair on the tail and just a tad too long. But that is the basic hairs or soft tackle. All right. Get a little too much head on it. And I tie these down to about a about an eighteen, I guess, if I'm if I'm fishing like the little creeks around here or something. Uh, I guess you could tie, you ever tie 18 for the little mo, Carlton? I tie my regular soft tackles in an 18, but uh, I do my guy's choice hairs here in a 14. In a 14. Now, for your 18 soft tackles, what feather do you use for that? Partridge? Partridge. Yep. There, there are... a good bit of cussing. Yeah, yeah. There are some feather, there are some methods out there to let you use big feathers on small hooks. And you can Google, I mean, we could do that in a workshop sometime, but it's, it's really not, it's really pretty straightforward. Um, and there's several YouTube videos on how to do that that let you use a feather this size on a size 18 hook. Which, see, normally this, this feather's really sized for that hook, this hook we just used. Okay. All right. Everybody good on this fly? We've got, you, you should have enough materials to tie one more copy of this when you get home. All right, our next one, we're going to go down in size a little bit. This is the more tricked out version. It's going to be, this is similar, very similar to a guide's choice hairs here. And we're basically going to do what we, what we just did. Oh. Any questions on, online, guys? I thought I heard something. Good? All right, you should, have in, you should have a couple of beads and a couple of jig hooks. A jig hook, a size, this is a size 14 jig hook. And the beads are 764 slotted tungsten. And if you haven't used beads before, you put the point of the hook through the small hole of the bead. There's a slot on one side of it, and if you drop your beads on the floor, I have more beads. But yeah, it should be when you drop your bead on the floor. I did. All right. And for real small hooks, I find these uh, test clips handy to hold the hook and thread it on the bead if it's really small but this this one's not that small you can yep and that's a good idea to put the hook upside point up in your vise and and feed it on there now there is a right and an, a correct and an incorrect orientation on these um, we're not really going to talk about that specifically tonight, but you, if you spin it one way, it fits down farther on the, 
on the uh, uh, jig part of the hook toward the eye like that. It fits all the way down. If you orient it the other way, it doesn't quite go all the way down. So you want to roll your bead around to where it's, where it's all the way down onto the uh, back of the eye of the hook. And this time I'm not going to forget to uh, start our thread. So let's start our thread right behind the bead. And I, I like to take, oh, a dozen or so wraps at least right behind the bead to kind of hold it in place. And then let's wrap all the way back to where the bend of the hook starts. Now this is a barbless hook. So the bend of this hook is about where the barb would be if this, um, if this actually had a barb. And then wrap forward. I like to go back all the way to just behind the bead. So I have a thread base all the way back and then all the way forward. Now for trout, this is a great hook, but for bluegill and um, panfish of any sort, I don't use barbless hooks. I like a barbed hook. And my absolute favorite hook for these, this is a J. Stockard hook, um, but it's actually made by Umqua. I'll show you the Umqua version. And this is a size 14, they're 604. It's a big, it's a big 14. You can see it's much longer than the hook that's in the vise. But that's what I like about it. For like bluegill flies, it's barbed, and I tie all of my jig bluegill flies on this hook. And it's a 14, it's really about the size of a 12. It's a big hook. And the Umqua number on the same hook is 555 jig. So if you want a, um, if you want a barbed hook, these, these are really good hooks to, to tie these kind of flies on. Just order it one size smaller than you want. So if you, if you want a 12, order a 14. If you want a 14, order a 16. But those, and they're, they're cheap. They're like 12 bucks for 50. So they're, they're fairly cheap. What was the numbers again? 14, 604, I got. 604 was the uh, Stockard number, and 555 is the Umqua number. Same hook. It's exactly the same hook, yeah. So if you want a barbed hook, barbed jig hook, I highly recommend those. And they're a really strong hook. Uh, matter of fact, this, this is a hook when Jim and I were fishing for, uh, no, you weren't on me on that trip, caught a, a, about an eight pound uh, carp on this down in New Orleans on this, this size hook. And it landed that, what was eight and a quarter pounds, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a really strong hook. This is, it's a good one. I actually one. caught one last weekend on this pattern on the same hook. Okay, cool. Cool. It hold up well. And the only reason I tried that for carp is because I called Chris on the phone and said they're not eating anything I, send, I put in front of them. And he suggested I throw a small, a small fly. All right. Now, let's, um, our next step is to tie our tail in. So let's get our zonker strip back out. And I'm not going to grab quite as much this time. And it varies from strip to strip. This one looked real thin, so I grabbed a lot more. Um, and you can kind of grab some and hold it before you cut it off to see if you get, that's really about what I like, so about, about that amount. So I'm going to, and that's about, probably more like a quarter of an inch than three eighths of an inch. So I'm going to cut that off, cut that off the skin. Pick out all that under fur at the base of it. And this one's pretty even. I don't have any of those long stragglers to, um, to pull out on this one. It's, it's, it's pretty even. Okay, and so I'm going to hold tight right here. So 
So now I have a nice, a nice clump. And just like before, we want a fairly short tail. So something about a hook gap and length. Now, so I'm holding this with my right <laughs> hand. Again, I'm a right-handed tire. I'm going to transfer this to my left hand, but I'm not going to tie it in yet. Because I'm tying behind the bead, I like to pre-trim the tail. So I'm going to reach in and using the back of the, the bead as a guide, trim my, my feathers off, my feathers, my hair off right there. So that way I don't have to trim any, any, any tag end off of, off of the rabbit fur once I tie it in. And I'm going to give my bobbin a quick counterclockwise twist just to make sure that thread jumps to the back. See how it jumps to the back now? A couple of loose wraps over. And then a couple of tight wraps. Now I'm not going to worry about that little fuzzy part at the front. I'm going to pick that back up in just a second. But just like I did before, I want to hold this up with my left hand and pull it towards me. And as I wrap, that's that as I'm because I'm holding that hair up, that thread slides right down that hair, keeps it on top of the hook, and keeps my thread wraps together. And I want to go back to that same point above where there would be a barb. And again, I got it a little bit longer than I like, but that's okay. And then I wrap back forward, go ahead and take that little fuzz down with your thread and come back, leave your thread right at the bead. Right behind the bead? Right behind the bead, yes. A wire is next. So, now since I have a bead, I'm going to use a little bit different technique. Before, I tied it in with a long, a long tail and then pulled it back. Here I've got a bead that actually stops the wire, so I'm just going to stick the, the wire into the back of the bead. So I'm going to stick the wire into the back of the bead and then tie it all the way to the rear. All the way to the back of your thread base and then back to the hook point. You don't have to go back all the way forward. Now the reason I tied that hair in all the way up to the uh, back of the bead, if I hadn't, I would have a, 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 a very thin spot in the body of my fly. And so when I, put, when I get to my hackle, I'll have a smaller diameter there than I did at the back of the hook, so it kind of throws off. It's not really a taper, but it throws off the, the levelness of the body. See here I have a nice relatively level body all the way up to the front. So it's very similar. So now I can control the thickness of the body by how thick I wrap my dubbing on my thread. And I can make a tapered body if I like, but I'm not going to do that. Now the difference, whereas before we, we took our dubbing all the way up to the front, we're only going to take our dubbing up to about a bead's width behind the bead. So I want to stop this hair's ear dubbing about where the point of my scissors, the point of my scissors is. So roughly a bead. It's not, not critical, but roughly a bead width behind the bead. So you don't need as much dubbing on your thread. It's, one, it's a smaller hook. And two, we're going to uh, stop it a bit earlier. So get your clump of hair's ear. And, uh, nope, clump of hair's ear right now. We're going to use that other in just a second. Uh, Richard, it's going to be after we wrap our wire, we're going to uh, use that. So let's make a, a thin dubbing loop, or not dubbing loop, thin dubbing rope. And this stuff, I like to apply it pretty sparse. I'm actually. And notice I'm leaving a little gap right here at the right by the right by the fly. And I'm only going to put maybe I can always add it's easier to add than it is to take off. So I'm gonna make a dubbing rope that's maybe an inch and a quarter. 
and you can see it's pretty thin. It's a little thicker at the bottom than it is at the top. And again, I wrap all the way, that wrap that bare thread to the back to where hopefully that dubbing starts right at the back of my thread. Now, you can also start wrapping in front of your thread base if you want a little hot spot at the tail. So I, so I, could, I could actually start the dubbing there and have a little, little of that orange thread showing, but I'm gonna go all the way to the back with it and make touching wraps forward and actually I have a little bit too much dubbing here. That's, that's about where I want to stop. Maybe one more turn right there. And hair's ear without wax is pretty unruly. So, or spit, Carlton. So I have this little short body of dubbing and then a gap before the back of my bead. So go ahead and take your wire, and this time you're only going to make probably three wraps. Let's see, there's one, two, three. And then just like I did before, I'm going to take a wrap around my thread with my wire and bring it up and then tie it off. With a couple of wraps behind the wire, then a couple of wraps in front of the wire. And helicopter it off. In case you hadn't realized it, hare's ears are very buggy flies. They are very buggy. Now, you should also have a little clump of this sparkly dubbing in your package. Now, at, at this point, if we were going, if we were tying a God's Choice hare's ear, it has peacock hurl in this gap tied in, actual peacock hurl, and it has a piece of flash aboo, some flash that makes a wing case on it. So if we were actually tying a God's Choice hare's ear, we would now tie in that flash, we'd tie in then some peacock hurl, wrap the flash over the top, tie it in, but we're not going to do any of that. We're just going to take this little clump of shiny dubbing and dub this gap with that, with that dubbing. What kind of dubbing is this? This is... SLF Prism and Peacock. Peacock, yeah, I got you. Yep, SLF if, Prism and Peacock. If you use uh, Peacock Hurl, do you still use the dubbing option? No, no. Um, this is just quicker than Peacock Hurl for me. And Peacock Hurl is great stuff. And, you know, I probably still tie some just like the guy's choice hairs here. But this, you don't need much of it at all. And... I mean, probably that might be three quarters of an inch, maybe. And I'm going to slide it up almost to the fly and then dub it in that. And I need just a little bit more. Slide it up and dub all the way to the back of the bead. So I now have this kind of almost half and half. It's, it really should be about two-thirds rabbit and about one-third of this peacock. My bead had slipped up, and so I stopped my rabbit a little bit too early. And now the only thing that remains is to tie our soft tackle in, just like we did before. And I'm going to use the darker soft tackle 
the one that's kind of a darker brown. And the only, there's nothing special about it. They're just a little bit smaller than the lighter brown ones. But you want to, this is a size 14 hook, so you want to choose one of your smaller ones, whether it's the dark one or the light one. And I think the dark ones are going to be a little bit smaller for you. So I'm going to strip all of these fuzzies again off. And I'm also, again, going to strip all of these, these fibers off before the speckles part starts. I'm going to strip those off. So now I'm left with a little clump of, of feathers. Now, if any of you ever tie in soft tackles by the base instead of the tip, Yep, you could do that here if you, we're not going to, but you, if you wanted to tie it in by the base, you just lay it there and then spin it by the tip. But I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do well with that method. But you see some of the YouTube videos, they, they do it that way. So just like before, I'm going to grab the tip. And soft tackles don't need a lot of feathers on the actual fly. I probably have three-eighths of an inch at the most there for this size 14. Concave side toward the, toward the hook. I'm just going to lay that and I'm going to tie it right in that, in that V. But remember, we're going to do a couple of loose wraps. One, two loose wraps. And then let me angle this where you can see it. I'm going to pull back on this sixteenth uh, of an inch or so, and then tighten down on the, a couple of tight wraps, and then trim off that excess. And hopefully, we won't break the feather. If you do break the feather, just back a little bit of your thread off, tie another feather in, and and do another one. So attach my, let me zoom out here, attach my handy spring-loaded hackle pliers here. And again, I want to just mash those feathers back, just press them together. You don't want to really stroke them back because you might break the feather. But see there, all, both pointing to the rear and make some very, very gentle wraps. Did you break it? Yep, yep they, they're very fragile, yep. This is in front of the... Um... In front of the peacock dubbing, but behind the bead, yes. Thank you, Rich. That's, uh... And then when you get to the bare stem, a couple of thread wraps to tie it off. A couple of thread wraps behind the stem, and then we'll do a couple of thread wraps in front of the stem. And then I'll reach in and cut off the tag end of that. Oh, did I hear a broken feather online there? Was that Peter broke a feather? My feather didn't break, my thread broke. Oh, no. <laughs> didn't now, expect that. One thing about this hen back is it doesn't, the fibers don't splay out as much. They have a ten tendency to kind of stick together, but you can just get your bodkin and, and just spread them out if they have a tendency to stick together. And at this point, just sweep those feathers back and create a little hot spot with about eight or 10 wraps of thread at the front and then whip finish. So five turn whip finish and trim your tag end off, and that is it. So 
you have any overly long fibers, you can reach in and trim those if you like, or just leave them there for the bugginess of it. And in the water, the, the, the hackles on this and the water fold back over the body and create a really nice profile. And then it stops, they, they, they kind of undulate back up. And with that, that uh, flashy dubbing underneath gives it, gives it a nice bit of flash. So it's kind of a simpler God's Choice hair's ear, a little bit easier to tie, a couple of steps less, but um, just building on that basic, basic hair's ear. And again, you should have enough materials to tie another copy of this one as well. Now this fly, you can strip it, but with the, you know, with the, with the bead on it, it'll sink a little bit more, which is a good thing, but it'll have kind of a jigging motion, or you can fish it under an indicator. It works real well under an indicator, particularly with this tungsten bead. I, I tie them a lot with a brass bead if I'm gonna strip them and it's not quite as, as heavy as it is with a tung tungsten bead, and it uh, doesn't sink, sink quite as much. Yeah, I really should have, my uh, rabbit should go to about right here. Kind of right about there is where I would want my rabbit to I started a little bit, stopped a little bit too soon.